Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Noyes, Head of Americas for the Alternative Investment Management Association, or AMA. We're the global trade body for hedge funds, and as hedge funds get more involved in digital, digital assets. So um, one of the many things I do is work very closely with our AMA dog group, um, which is an endless source of puns. It's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. <laughs> So AMA has been working in the digital asset space now. We did a bit sort of in the 2017, 2018 wave, and then it's been a lot bigger way now that we've had this convergence with hedge funds since mid 2020. So this is what we're here to talk about today. Um, I know two of these fantastic women from their pre-crypto days. So um, I'm gonna ask everyone to introduce themselves. And as part of that introduction, um, share a little bit about what got you into crypto. So Camille, put sure. you on the hot spot. Sure, yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Camille Cordero, and I'm a senior relationship manager at Anchorage Digital. Anchorage is a platform that provides the services institutions need in order to participate in digital assets. And so we provide what is a traditional PB stack. It's custody, trading, it is reporting, uh, financing, and everything in between. Um, so to answer your question, Michelle, how I got into crypto, a uh, former colleague of mine at BTIG actually, uh, who had a background in securities, was a crypto nut and came to work every day with a hardware wallet that was like a USB around his neck. And I thought that was extreme at the moment, but it sparked my interest because I thought if somebody was wearing something around their neck, then it must be pretty valuable and that was 2017 so had I bought Bitcoin at the time I would probably be sitting in this chair under different circumstances <laughs> um, but uh, being in prime brokerage at BTIG and then previously at BNP Paribas gave me the understanding of what functions like DTC and clearing houses serve for counterparties that we work with today and so I believe that blockchain technology is positioned to make those functions obsolete. And when I was approached by a former mentor, an existing mentor of mine, I should say, who I worked with at BNP to join Anchorage, it was an incredible opportunity for me because it was basically providing a solution that I saw coming down the pipe. And it was a way for me to join uh, OCC, federally chartered digital asset bank, still the only one today and a pioneer, in my opinion, in the digital asset space in terms of technological technological, and a regulatory standpoint. Wonderful, and that colleague of yours, not only is he a trend maker in finance, but maybe in fashion, now Fendi and Ledger have this collab going on, so. <laughs> exactly. Um, Jennifer, over to you. Yeah, great, I'm Jennifer Murphy. Uh, last year I founded a firm called Runa Digital Assets to specialize in managing portfolios of digital assets, but the approach is deeply rooted in traditional finance, or as we in now in digital assets call it, TradFi. Um, so I come from TradFi, so do my partners from asset management, from quantitative research, from um, capital markets, and uh, all three of us had a similar experience. My experience was most recently at Western Asset, uh, the global bond firm, as the chief operating officer. We actually developed um, blockchain-based applications with um, IBM. We did the first, um, we bought the first bond that was issued on a blockchain infrastructure um, through JP Morgan with the National Bank of Canada. And um, that was really like the moment you described, Camille, um, when our portfolio managers put the trade in and it settled instantly, they understood, everyone understood at Western, this is really important. This can and will change everything, I agree. So um, that's why we decided to start um, this firm. But we think that um, five years in, uh, after 2017, the sort of last uh, excitement about digital assets, Back then, most of these projects were two guys in a white paper, uh, and they were issuing tokens to finance really the building of, uh, of something from nothing. That's totally different now. These are real projects now. These are real, real user bases, real technology, real businesses with revenues, with profits. So we're bringing the disciplines of equity valuation, sort of fundamental research, risk research, which really doesn't exist today in crypto, um, from our experience in TradFi to um, digital assets. Wonderful. And then it's always fun when I'm not the only Michelle on a panel, the <laughs> fantastic Michelle Perry. The other Michelle. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm uh, with Galaxy Digital, um, which is, I guess they would like to be um, 
sort of the investment bank of uh, crypto assets. I'm in the asset management division. Um, I personally am focusing on operational due diligence of our uh, venture and hedge fund investments. We have a number of multi-manager products. Um, I joined about six months ago from Axia, which is a global consultant, uh, focusing in the hedge funds and venture space as well, doing due diligence. And before that, I've you know been doing ODD for a long time. So I think the idea is to um, bring sort of an institutional approach to investing, but investing in the crypto world. So I, I was just really, I mean, I've been in crypto a little bit myself. It was really exciting to uh, move from TradFi into this like cutting edge yeah. uh, space or the future of finance. Well, thank you everyone for sh sharing your aha moments. Um, so in the bit of time we have today, we'll talk a little bit about the state of the digital asset markets some of the challenges that still exist, um, which is why we, we all have things to do, and then some of the biggest trends that we're all looking forward to. So um, it's never a dull moment in the digital assets markets. Um, Jennifer, can you give us a state of the markets? Yeah, state of the markets. I think if you had fallen asleep on January 1st and woken up today, it wouldn't seem like that much had happened, but, but a lot happened. So uh, three things, the Fed, uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine and the White House directive um, executive order on digital assets. It's been all those. That's the triple threat of macro that's been uh, dominating digital asset markets and I guess all other markets as well. Um, so we've been struggling uh, with that um, sort of incorporating that into uh, the portfolio and our approach. Um, but fortunately, at least two, maybe two and a quarter of those things have been largely resolved. You know, the Fed is, so, their plans are largely known now, so at least markets reflect that. The executive order um, from the White House was expected to be quite seriously negative, I think. That's what I expected. Gary Gensler and Janet Yellen and Senator Warren are sort of the, you know, the three, the trio that uh, consistently t brings us to task for not uh, doing, uh, in their view, what's right. But the executive order was constructive. And uh, since then, uh, at least Janet Yellen's comments about um, digital assets have been rec a recognition of how important they are. So um, bo th both of those things have largely resolved. Of course, the Russia invasion of Ukraine is, um, still ongoing and still affecting markets. But just a note um, today, right now, in a few hours, the government of Ukraine is issuing NFTs that sort of a dual purpose. One is they are raising money for the war effort, and the other is they are memorializing in art, in documents, in um, their, their own point of view about the war so that it can never be forgotten. And so that's one of the great benefits of a blockchain is nothing's ever forgotten. <laughs> so it's always there. Um, and I thought that was an incredibly interesting and unexpected uh, way that digital assets are having an impact on the world. Yeah, no, certainly, certainly never a dull moment. Um, and Michelle, where you sit and you know, the Vision Hill Group as a yeah. fund to fund in this space, you have a great amount of visibility in terms of how the strategies are evolving. You know, it's no longer just buying and holding Bitcoin. So how are you seeing that evolve? Are there are, are funds flowing to specific strategies over others? What are some of the new exciting things coming up? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, we have both the venture products and we have hedge fund products and we're seeing, and passive actually, but we're seeing the most interest, like maybe six times the interest in the venture funds. Um, and I think, this is probably because, you know, for investors, they already have that vertical sleeve as for ventures, an easier fit. Crypto, you know, in terms of that quarterly reporting, it's easier to deal with that volatility that you might see in terms of more regular reporting. And it also just fits within that mindset that crypto is a five, 10 year time horizon rather than a short term vision. So I think people are able to, you know, process that easier. Um, we're having, you know, family offices and, um, you know, in the, you know, high net worth, it's easier for them to make those allocations. In terms of like pensions or institutional investors, we're having a ton of conversations. We're doing, you know, we're having ODD and ID done on us, but in actual capital commits, it's been a bit slower. And so the challenges of the last three months, you know, trying to f f raise funds through a war, it's definitely, you know, it's been trickier, but um, uh, sort of some headwinds against that. But, you know, just, in terms of that interest is definitely more on the on the, on that venture on the venture on the venture side. There's you know some interest on that hedge fund, definitely in terms of that liquidity. But um, um, I think the U.S. is definitely the most advanced. Middle East has very high interest. Europe is behind 
in terms of their allocation. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. No, and that would that would mirror. I mean, again, we're seeing a lot of money go into venture um, on the hedge fund side. I think the sub strategy that's been notable to me and just seeing in the market launches is digital yield. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, that's really emerged and. Folks are either adding that to their allocation or just starting de novo. Um, we're seeing some more market neutral, right? You know, in the, in the first inning of 2021, you might have asked who would go market neutral mm -hmm. in this market, and then you know, volatility reminded us that it it can go down as well as it can go, go yeah, up. It has so. a place, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So you've seen some growth of market neutral strategies as well, but capacity constrained. And again, yeah. when you mirror that to the growth of venture. It's, um, it's put in perspective. Although I will say too, coming, I think most of us have hedge fund backgrounds and in this space, there's a lot more crossover between hedge and venture than in the TradFi market. So you see hedge funds launching venture funds like you, as well as venture funds launching hedge funds to manage the liquidity because their LPs don't want to take distributions and tokens. Yeah. Um, and I think like just yeah. last year there was I think thirty two billion went into crypto venture alone. It was a five percent of total allocations in venture. Yeah, no, for sure. And then Camille, we keep hearing about the institutions. The institutions are coming. The institutions are coming. When are they coming? Where are they? <laughs> the institutions have arrived, quite honestly. Um, and you know, I, I there's different ways to think about institutions. Um, all of Anchorage clients are institutions. We have zero retail flow today. So I have an inside view about where the allocations are going in a very specific manner. Um, at, from a top down perspective, you have bulge bracket banks, sovereign, bra sovereign banks, um, community banks, fintech banks, having their clients ask for digital assets and the accessibility to digital assets. Um, and so what, what these banks are doing are using Anchorage as a solution and other competitors as a solution to offer digital assets to their clients, which is really amazing and one of my favorite integrations. Um, and then from a traditional asset allocation perspective, I cover some of the largest asset managers in the world. I cover hedge funds, PE firms, VC firms, corporate treasuries, and family offices. And so I like to think about asset allocation and diversification into digital assets as a crawl, walk, run. The crawl is typically really conservative. It means people are buying blue chip cryptos, which are Bitcoin and Ethereum. They have a long-term view and they're just gonna buy and hold. And so at the end of 2021, what we found was a lot of these hedge funds and asset managers wanted more interesting ways to generate alpha and they wanted to hedge for inflation. And so, the walk was yield farming. And so they were leveraging Anchorage specifically in our financing capabilities in order to deposit into our lending pools in a safe way. And this is called centralized finance and earning competitive yields on cash and Bitcoin and other more liquid uh, crypto assets. And then there were firms also taking those crypto assets that they have a long conviction in depositing them and using them as collateral to borrow more cash, which I thought was interesting, so that they could facilitate strategies like market neutral and more yield farming to double down on those strategies. Um, <clears throat> and so then the run it expresses itself. Ah, I forgot, mm -hmm. hold on before we run. We have to talk about staking because there are yield um, there are yield generating assets today and so many coming into market that our clients are investing in specifically to earn yield and to stake. All of that can be done in the Anchorage app as well. So the run expresses itself in much more complex products that we're used to in traditional banks, right? So their options and futures, mm -hmm. their swaps. Um, and I would say those are less popular today because the infrastructure in crypto is not quite there yet, um, just because of capital inefficiency. But I think that from my seat, it's something that I think a lot of firms like Galaxy and Anchorage are trying to solve for it, and we can talk about this later. And hopefully once we get to a point where there's more capital efficiency, we will see a lot more complex products and digital assets. No, that's an excellent point. And to the point of you know hedge fund integration, AMA conducted a survey last year as part of the third annual crypto hedge fund report and we found about 21% of hedge funds had some exposure. And I'm talking about, it gets weird, traditional hedge funds, legacy hedge funds, these things that used to be alternative, maybe less alternative. 
Um, you know, and I think we're conducting that research right now for the fourth annual. Um, so please, if you're a hedge fund, answer the survey so we can get data. Because I think it'll be really interesting to see how that number has changed as well as, you know, how some of the challenges have changed, right? We've seen a lot of inf infrastructure growth, but everybody keeps moving on to more complex types of investing. So it's, you know, we fix it, find solutions, and then, okay, next. You're always a day behind. Keep leveling oh, up. Sure. So, uh, yeah. So let's talk about some of these challenges. Um, Michelle, from the allocator perspective, what are the, what do you see when you're conducting ODD? Yeah. I. Uh, I guess it's specifically on our emerging manager side, many of these managers are very are small on the smaller side, I think, that, and they still haven't really set up that back office. So we're speaking to managers who don't have any, don't have any back office or CFO ops at all, um, not even an outsourced solution. They perhaps don't even have an audit in place, and they are reluctant to get one. But some of those because it's cost constrained, and often those because these guys are crypto natives. And they are not from a finance background, so they're just not used to the infrastructure in place that you need to, you know, have a sizable business. And as their AUM grows, and you know, they're definitely going to have to step it up. Um, also, in terms of registering with the ACC, um, I think because of the nature of some of the investments, the token holdings, that actually they would trigger the need to register the ACC earlier than the standard venture fund, for example. So. Um, you're seeing a little bit of trip up there in terms of needing to step up their compliance where they might have been a bit behind. Um, so I think you know that's been one of our one of our biggest challenges. The other one is on reporting. Um, you know, just looking at the, the timing of the reporting is often been very delayed. Like just in terms of financial statements, even like the biggest and brightest and best funds out there is like the financial statements are nine, ten, eleven months late. Um, and the quarterly reporting, monthly reporting is super delayed. And I think it's because the administrators and the service providers are still struggling with the valuation and recording of, you know, treating the accounting treatment, et cetera. So that's been an interesting challenge. And yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And this is why I know you're part, you're part of our, our odd dogs, our operation <laughs> due diligence, digital asset working group, working through some of these challenges coming up with a standardized due diligence questionnaire yeah. so that that at least the asks and the expectations can be clear so that when these folks from you know more technology backgrounds they recognize the questions that are being asked and hopefully you know don't get tripped up by this but can actually get you the information you need in a timely manner and not spend all of their time doing that but instead you know doing things like generating alpha yeah and i just just on that as well the in just in terms of that like the custody of assets which is obviously something that keeps us up at night is like a lot of the managers might just hold you know access to that um, asset, that's why they need Anchorage, but access, access to the asset just themselves and they can move that asset out. And that's like one of the main pain points for fraud and, and just making sure they have those two-factor authentication and, and stuff like that that's in place is, an, is something that we're, we're really working with managers. To well, do. that is a perfect tee up for Camille. So <laughs> <laughs> what types of problems are you solving for your clients and are they coming to you with? Yeah, definitely. So specifically to your point, the two-factor authentication, we've solved for that problem by allowing our clients to have a multi-sig approval process. Um, we're leveraging biometric data via the iPhone in order for them to access a cold type storage wallet. Um, what we provide is smart storage. So we're negating the hot and cold storage paradigm and I can get into what hot and cold storage is over Mescal later on, <laughs> but we'll leave that there. Um, <clears throat> another issue that we're solving for is um, capital efficiency. We're launching a tri-party program today that is going to allow our clients to keep their assets in Anchorage safe custody, but integrate with exchanges, FCMs and OTC providers. And so one of the biggest inefficiencies in crypto today is having to post to every single exchange or FCM or OTC provider you'd like to trade with, whether it be Galaxy or Coinbase or um, BitGo, all of those exchanges need cash in order for you to trade. So with the relationships that Anchorage is building today, our clients can have bilateral relationships with every one of those exchanges, and then we step in as the third party doing collateral management on behalf of those exchanges, FCMs, and OTC providers. And then we have all of the technology to do that and the team to do it, right? So what we have is custody, we have a risk team that allows us to monitor, and then we have a trading team that allows us to liquidate. So. I'm excited yeah. about that problem. And <laughs> Jennifer, you're the fund manager in the room. Do all these problems sound familiar? Yes, Are there other do. obstacles? <laughs> I'm interested in what you're saying. Let's definitely. Talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I think some, you know, I think many of you are from uh, CPA firms and law firms, and I think you maybe you'll relate to or may start to um, come up against some of the things that we struggle with, which is there aren't the sort of good data sources that are comprehensive for digital assets. So what we're longing for is the Bloomberg of digital assets, which there's a firm called Masari that's sort of building towards that and others too. Um, there are not, there's no, in, there's no S&P 500 of digital assets. Again, there's Coindesk is building indices and so are others, but it doesn't exist today. Uh, we're, we're going back and building a database of historical prices because there's lots of disparate <laughs> sources, but no sort of central recognized source. And so um, one of the interesting issues that someone came to me with recently was a divorce lawyer who was uh, in a marital you know, separation and divorce what, there were NFTs and digital assets involved, and she was asking me, how do I value these? And what's interesting about NFTs is there's a lot of um, trade data, but there's very, there's no, we, we actually have an analyst who just records data each day about <laughs> NFTs so that we can have a historical data about pricing. So um, it's a very, um, it's still very uh, disjointed, uh, that infrastructure underneath, which relates to, I think, the other thing that I wanted to mention um, you know, we're trying to, one of our goals is to help our clients who are often um, ultra high net worth investors or family offices to sort of get into this ecosystem. So we minted an NFT at the end of last year for um, our clients, and but uh, almost none of them, I think all but one, d didn't have a digital wallet. So we, we sort of have, uh, you know, our team on the phone with them, sort of helping them download the digital wallet and get the NFT. Well, it's a horrible user experience, isn't it? I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. It's so janky. Even if you're a technologist, it's really, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's confusing. Um, so I think the user experience in digital assets really needs to improve to really realize, you know, for, for it really to be mainstream. So that's a huge issue. I have a multi-page on streaming document. <laughs> getting folks on board with NFTs. And since you brought NFTs to the party, we're talking about trends. I think that's at least one trend that can't be ignored. Um, and it's interesting because, it, you know, like most of this space, it starts out retail and then suddenly institutions are buying JPEGs. Yeah. yeah. Camille, what are you all doing when it comes to NFTs? Yeah, so in NFTs has been the most interesting adoption of crypto that I've seen over the last three months and really quite unexpected. Um, it's We've seen so much interest in NFTs that we've built an NFT custody service. Um, and, and we found that our clients need a safe way to custody th these assets because there has been a lot of hacks um, in this specific product. And so when I think about institutions and how and why they're interested in NFTs, there are three specific ways that come to mind. The first is one that you mentioned, Jennifer, which is in order to understand the product, you got to buy it, you need to interact with it, and you need to understand it by way of using it. And so audit firms, uh, fund administrators that I'm familiar with, um, and firms like Anchorage are getting involved and are purchasing NFTs so that they can learn how to use the product to offer better services to their clients. The second way that is interesting to me personally is ESG, which there was a panel about earlier. We are seeing um, you know, folks that are purchasing EF NFTs uh, for diversity and inclusion initiatives, NFTs that are run by Bi BIPOC folks and that are run by women, where the proceeds are going to foundations. You mentioned Ukraine, mm -hmm. perfect example. All of these are great ways for people to get involved. Then we also see on that ESG front, the NFT carbon offsets which is a way for people to, obvious reasons, don't need to explain that. Um, and then the third way that people are, you know, looking to get involved with NFTs is to really kind of invest in a product where they can see capital advancement and capital growth in the future. Um, I, I have to bring up the Bored Apes example because this is the most recent and we've seen in the news, but um, it was a flurry for me, quite honestly, at Anchorage. I had so many hedge funds reach out to me interested in buying Bored Apes over the last three weeks um, on the heels of the announcement that there was going to be a distribution of this ape token. Um, and so, you know, we were we can custody Bored Apes. We brokered the deal for Visa Q3. We can do um, CryptoPunks, Bored Apes, and Mutant Apes today. And we had a lot of movement in Bored Apes, and now we custody that product. I thought that the most interesting part was these ape tokens that were distributed is a way for 
our clients to get token access. Um, so it's a network that you're getting access to and potentially free money. These APE tokens had a $2 billion market cap last week. That's insane. And now they're set to be worth almost $20 this week. So basically by buying a board ape, you had the opportunity to get free money. And I think our line, a lot of our clients are seeing the upside potential in these collectors items specifically. And that's, you know, also to the point of, you know, a lot of institutional investors are having to figure out not only how do I hold these tokens, but how do I use them whether they're an NFT or, you know, a more traditional um, fungible token, right? You you miss out on a trick if you're not staking, if you're not getting the yield, if you're also if you're not participating in the governance. Sometimes a project misses out from not having those active holders. Um, Jennifer, what other trends are you do you have on your eye on this year? Well, we're very focused on NFTs, so I I love what all that Camille said. Um, but one of the things that we're very interested in that I think is important um, to understand about digital assets is it's it's been uh, likened to the gold rush, right? So if you think of when the gold rush happens and everyone's rushing west and all, um, there were those who were sort of panning for gold, and uh, those are people like me. But then there's all this um, infrastructure that needs to be there to support them. Um, so people selling picks and shovels, and that's a, a word, uh, something you hear a lot in digital assets. Um, you know, uh, people are scared of tokens, but you know, give me the picks and shovels. Um, you know, we need pubs, we need <laughs> picks and shovels, we need tents. You know, things like that. That I, that I can count on. Uh, panning for gold is too risky. Well, right now in digital assets, that that infrastructure is is either non-existent or very fragile. So there's a number of things that have happened recently. One of the big trends in digital assets is kind connecting blockchains um, through um, bridges. Bridges is a good intuitive <laughs> name for them, that's what they're called. Uh, but there's been two hacks of bridges uh, between blockchains in the last um, month or so that have told it almost a billion dollars of lost assets. So that's an enormous issue. But there are tokens, um, we call them utility tokens, but you could think of them as like business to business, um, businesses, uh, um, organizations, and they are picks and shovels. So they're providing data, they're providing uh, these solutions to help the builders of, you know, the people who are panning for gold. So I think that's a huge, they don't get a lot of attention, they're not very sexy, they're called like chain link and the graph, you know, um, but they're, and most um, retail investors wouldn't interact with them, but they're really important important to the future of Web3. Okay, so I got NFTs, picks and shovels. <laughs> Michelle, bring us home. What trend do you have your eye um, on? Well, we definitely, DAOs I think are just, it's a huge focus of us. You know, we, we've tried to invest in them, but uh, the liability issues, and if there's some lawyers in the room can help us figure it out, but it's sort of like that unlimited liability. Is like it, it was, we couldn't wrap our heads around it. And, but I think that's something going to become increasing importance. And I know like, um, you know, this just, came out of the office today and everyone's talking about Andrew Yang's one. He's got <laughs> minted an NFT and he's gonna have a party and like if you if you buy his NFT then he'll follow you on Twitter and it's like this whole community around it and I think DAOs are just gonna you know they have the Constitution DAO, we've got like the Lynx DAO with the golf course and everyone had a great successful golf game. So I think it's gonna be a lot of social um, you know like connectivities around these DAOs is gonna link you up with you know the cool people of things that you like to be associated with and if you don't get in early, you might miss out on the community. Yeah. The community aspect is super important. Um, I also just think more boring stuff. I think there's a lot of consolidation in the industry, more service providers. There's going to be more systems that can support, um, you know, accounting systems and trading systems and all that, you know, like Luca and stuff. All these things are going to build up to support um, just investing in the, in, in the space and building that security and security around the bridges is going to yeah. be a huge focus after these hacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think we gave a lot of folks some good conversation starters for Mescal coming up in just a few minutes. Um, but, you know, it's a topic that can't be ignored. I think that's the important thing. Whether or not you're going to be in a digital asset dedicated career or fund, debatable, but there's more and more convergence. So if you're involved in the hedge fund world, be it as an allocator or as a service provider, there's a good chance they're dipping at least a big toe into this space and it behooves you to get up to speed and understand. And sometimes actually the best way to understand is just by doing it. It is a horrible user <laughs> interface for sure. But going through some an experience like minting an NFT and moving that to cold storage and having your heart stop, you have an appreciation <laughs> for custody um, and newfound. So um, I'm sure any of us would be happy to help you through that process 
but thank you so much, ladies, for your time and your knowledge sharing today. Thanks, thank Michelle. You. Thank you. Mm -hmm.